Hello everyone and welcome to the South Coast Young Planners Network Nitrates webinar. The first for the South East region. So I'm Laura Archer, I'm planner at Barton Wilmore in the Southampton office and the chair of the South Coast Young Planners Network. In these strange times, the committee are still working hard together to create new ways of connecting with other professionals, this webinar being one. For this webinar, we're using GoToWebinar and you will see a chat tab on your screen. If you have any questions as we go through, please do submit them. At the end of the presentation, we will aim to have 20 minutes for questions and answers. Any questions which we don't manage to get through, Peter is kindly offered to write your answers within the next week or so. There will also be a feedback survey emailed to you after this webinar, and we would really appreciate it if you could fill it in for us. So now I'm excited to introduce our presenter for today's Nitrates webinar, Peter Holm. Peter is an Associate Director within the planning team at Turley Southampton office. Since joining in June 2016, Peter has undertaken work on a wide range of residential development projects and strategic land promotions across Hampshire, Dorset, Sussex and Kent. The majority of Peter's clients are medium and larger house builders with extensive interests within the Solent area. Prior to becoming a planning consultant, Peter worked in the public sector for 10 years as a planning policy officer at two South Coast planning authorities and also in central government as a policy advisor on planning obligations and the community infrastructure levy. So I'm now going to turn my video off and over to you, Peter. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Laura, for that uh, introduction and um, welcome all of you from me um, to what I believe is the RTPI Southeast first webinar. And it's a real pri privilege to be asked to present this um, to you this morning. Um, I'm also going to turn my video camera off, um, if that's all right, just so I can concentrate on the presentation, but I will turn it back on again at the end um, for the questions. OK, so let's kick straight off. Um, this summarises what I'm going to cover to, to this morning. Um, obviously, well, there'll be a, a brief background. I don't know um, how much all of you know about uh, the nitrates issue already. We'll look at Natural England's evolving response to this, um, which areas are affected, what is affected, um, the impact of Natural England's advice, quantifying that impact, and then we'll look at the development industry response. And finally, we'll look at the um, Natural England's latest guidance and then look at the solutions and the mitigation um, options that we have available. So first of all, um, it's this word eutrophication, which I'm sure we've all heard before, but um, do we really know what it actually means? Well, in scientific terms, eutrophication is simply the excessive buildup of nutrients, principally nitrates and phosphates, um, which can enter a water body, in this case, the Solent area of water. Um, it can enter from three main sources, from surface water runoff from rivers from groundwater, or directly from wastewater treatment works. The problem with this nitrate, nitrogen fertilizer or, or, or nitrates that comes in is it creates algal growth. And algae takes the oxygen out of the water and harms ecosystems in that way. And ultimately, water can be anoxic, where the oxygen is so depleted that uh, marine wildlife can't uh, live anymore. And that's where it causes the most severe problems. <clears throat> so why is this a problem for the Solent? Well, quite simply, the Solent is a very special place. It's a place of um, very varied landscapes with creeks and harbours, mud flats, um, and it's highly protected. It's protected by different layers of um, European designations, uh, special areas of conservation and special protection areas. And ultimately, this comes down to protecting the rare bird populations, which although seemingly common in the Solent area, are very rare on a European wide scale and are well worth protecting um, to a strong degree. So Natural England clearly have a role in upholding the habitat regulations and their initial approach to the nitrates issue in the Solent was to look at the impact that large developments were having. So this is back in 2018, where they were seeking for large developments of two to three hundred homes to be nitrogen neutral. Um, that didn't cause too much of an issue because generally larger developments um, have options in terms of how they can mitigate their impact. Um, on, on nutrient nu um, nutrient impact on the Solent. But then in 2019, um, ultimately with the version two of the advice in June 2019, 
the advice changed quite remarkably. And from that time, Natural England was stating that some sites are at risk from any increase in nutrient inputs. In other words, that all development involving overnight stays would have an impact on the Solent and therefore had to demonstrate nutrient neutrality. And all development um, with such an impact on the Solent would need to have an appropriate assessment. And that remains the current position for Natural England. So if we think about why Natural England changed their advice between 2018 and 2019, there are two main reasons for this. First of all, there was a study undertaken by Natural England which looked at the conservation condition of the Solent protected sites and found um, much their disappointment that the condition was worse than anticipated and that eutrophication was already actively causing um, harm to the integrity of the protected sites. The second reason is the what came to be called the Dutch nitrogen cases at the European Courts of Justice. These cases um, established a few very important legal principles, which I don't claim to be an expert on, on at all, but in short summary, it demonstrated that any development scheme which relies on mitigation should be subject to an appropriate assessment. And also the efficacy of mitigation me measures has to be sufficiently certain to discharge all reasonable scientific doubt. It's not limited to larger developments either. Developments have to be considered alone and in combination, meaning that even a single dwelling could um, fall under the uh, auspices of this regime. So if we think about where is affected, clearly it's the north and south coast of the Solent, but that involves quite a number of local planning authorities, as you see from the list there. Um, and that is clearly an understandable um, geographic area given the Solent coastline. But um, a little while later, in October 2019, it was found that Basingstoke and Dean was also being advised by Natural England that their own planning permissions were affected uh, by this issue. And that seems counterintuitive given that Basingstoke and Dean is 26 miles from the Solent coastline um, and led to a lot of very frustrating um, times with developers who couldn't understand the reason why their planning permissions, which were perfectly good um, developments, were being um, held up in the planning system. And the answer to this, of course, is the river catchment map, which you can see now, um, that large green area, which covers a substantial amount of the county of Hampshire, is the combined catchments of the, the Test and the Itchin rivers, and it, it really goes very far north, well into the Basingstoke and Dean area, and indeed includes small parts of Wiltshire as well. So it is a very wide geographical area, albeit that it is concentrated along the uh, Solent coastline um, for the most part. So if we think now about what types of uh, development are affected by Natural England's advice, um, the key term is this overnight accommodation. So that clearly involves residential dwellings, but it also involves other developments such as care homes, student halls, hospitals, hotels, prisons, um, holiday um, homes and camps, or any kind of development where people stay overnight. Even single dwellings, as I said before, are affected due to those in combination impacts. And it's not just outline and full applications which are affected. It can also bite at reserve matter stage, even if you've got an outline permission in place, and it can bite at prior approvals for permitted development. Um, all of them are included because, of course, the habitat regulations refers to all plans and projects. It doesn't discriminate between the different forms of planning that we divide our, our, our system into. So the impact of the change in Natural England's advice um, that required nitrogen neutrality for all schemes of overnight stay meant that mitigation was needed in many cases. And in those cases, mitigation had to be achieved in perpetuity, which Natural England has defined as 80 years plus in terms of the certainty that that mitigation will apply. That's a very high bar for many developments to achieve. And to demonstrating the ability to be nitrogen neutral is a very complicated matter for most sites, uh, very costly and particularly difficult for small sites or sites that are on brownfield land um, and don't have large areas of agricultural land that they can take out of agriculture to offset. The other complicating factor in terms of the impact 
<clears throat> is the fact that not all planning authorities have applied the advice in the same way. Some, such as Varenborough Council, have been very strict in applying the guidance, um, and this has effectively caused a moratorium of residential development. Excuse me. <clears throat> a moratorium um, has been caused. And this is really down to a fear of uh, judicial review by those local authorities if they don't apply the guidance in full. Other planning authorities, such as Southampton City Council, have been far more pragmatic in their approach. They've certainly been mindful of the issue when um, permitting some schemes, but in, in other cases, they don't feel that um, the level of impact was sufficient to warrant um, the moratorium impact that, that uh, has been felt elsewhere. So this it adds to the complication for the development industry that there is certainly no um, consistency across the board with local planning authorities. If we try to quantify the overall impact, it's, it's difficult to get figures. Um, the figures that you see on the graph here were from back in February. And this is for the what's called the Partnership for South Hampshire authorities. That's the authorities that work together jointly in South Hampshire. It doesn't therefore include Chichester, um, which has also got some schemes which we believe are, are being held up as well, but it will certainly account for the majority of them. And as you can see, it's well over 7,000 homes um, being caught up in the planning system uh, due to nitrates. The large majority of these are in Fair and Portsmouth, Winchester and Test Valley, um, proportionally less in, in other authorities. So clearly with such a level of impact, the development industry has sought to understand the issue and to make a response as far as it's able to. And what the development industry has done um, is come together and to form what's called the Solar Nitrates Developer Forum. Um, it was formed in the summer of, of last year. And it's really um, a group forum whereby these bodies can come together, can understand the issue, can compare their experiences, can think about the consistency of different local planning authorities, but it's also formed a group which can um, act together in terms of securing legal advice and even commissioning evidence-based reports where appropriate to, uh, to challenge and to uh, hold uh, natural England, um, methodology to, to scrutiny. The developer forum has some in principle concerns about the approach that Natural England has taken in its evolving advice. Um, and they can be summarized as these. First of all, whilst no one would deny that the development industry has a role to play in um, the increasing nitrogen impact on the Solent, it only accounts for a very small proportion of the overall nitrates which end up in the Solent. 70 to 80% of all nitrogen deposition is from agriculture, from nitrate fertilizers and from um, animal manure which ends up being washed over the land into rivers and therefore into the Solent. And of the remaining part, only a part comes from the development industry because industrial processes, manufacturing is also responsible to some degree. So there is some legitimate aggrieved feeling amongst the development industry that they are being disproportionately hit through the blunt tool of the habitat regulations uh, whereas others, such as farming and, and manufacturing, are not being hit in the same way, um, even though they are making equal, if not much greater, contributions to the overall problem. In farming, for example, um, the, in this country, we looked at voluntary arrangements of effectively bribing farmers to change practices. And that's very different from the very hard um, mechanism of the habitat regulations, which is causing this moratorium situation. Um, the development industry, and it is felt that it's not entirely fair. So let's think now about the latest uh, Natural England guidance. This was issued in March um, this year, just last month. Um, it is version four. Um, I previously talked about version two. The eagle-eyed amongst you might wonder what happened to version three. That version only lasted three days, but apparently was riddled with errors, so it was very quickly withdrawn. Um, and now we've got version four. Let's think about what that does in terms of changing the advice uh, compared to the previous version. Well, first of all, a small victory for the development industry that there is some correction now for the level of background nitrates in potable water. Water that we get through our taps that comes onto developments is not free of nitrates. 
it's actually, if you test it, and this has been done through a study which has been sponsored by the Development Forum, it's got as much as um, 10 or 20 milligrams per litre of nitrates in the water that comes into your taps. Therefore, it's unfair to entirely blame the development industry for the nitrates which in the water which leaves the development site when so much is coming on through the, the potable water. Natural England accepts the case in principle that, that some correction should be made, but they insist that only two milligrams per litre is allowable because they claim that the, anything above that represents a, um, a, an excessive buildup of nitrates in potable water, which shouldn't be there in the first place. And they've got a point, but they, therefore it should be the water industry which gets its act together rather than um, making the development industry pick up the tab. They have unfortunately now removed the 90% rule for wastewater treatment works where there is no nitrate permit. Now, most of the development um, in our area is going to be served by wastewater treatment works, which are licensed by the Environment Agency to um, discharge certain levels of nitrogen. And in those cases, when you're looking at the impact, you can assume that your level of, of impact will be up to 90% of that permit. But if you've got a wastewater treatment works, such as many of those in the north of Hampshire, which don't have permits, then you're not allowed. You have to assume 100% of that. So you'll be looking at 27 milligrams per litre um, as a default figure, which is uh, going to make a, a worst case scenario for you in terms of your development. There is some um, advice now on the target for water use, um, which is a bit confusing, to be honest, because whilst 110 litres per person per day is the acknowledged um, the level which the southeast and most of the southeast looks to because of the water stress um, environment, Natural England are now saying that we should be targeting 100 litres per person per day, even though this is beyond what is in most local plans um, and is therefore going to be um, quite challenging for local authorities to enforce. There is clarification on the scope of um, using local population assumptions. This is much clearer in the new advice compared to the previous advice. There is um, some reference to circumstances in which different scenarios for local population and, and internal migration might be used. Because previously, it was important to understand that Natural England assumes that every home built in the region was going to be occupied by people who migrated from outside of that region. Whereas, of course, in reality, we know that many people who buy homes in the region move from very other, other parts of the region itself from close by. So it's not 100 percent in migration. And that is now um, allowed for to some extent. There is clarification about the inputs of nit nitrates from woodland and from land not in agricultural use. And there's guidance on so-called package treatment plants. Those are private treatment plants where areas cannot access main sewers, which is helpful. Um, and there's much more guidance on the different types of mitigation. And that's really helpful. I say the main advantage and benefit of the new guidance compared to the previous version is the greater detail with which it looks at the different mitigation options, um, which I do encourage you to read for yourself because it does make it more, much more clear than it previously was. And finally, there are um, inclusions of something called the spatial and temporal principles. That's really just the idea about how long nitrates take to get from a development site into the Solent and the different types of geology and how that impacts the level of um, infiltration of the water and the nitrates and the time it will take to get to the Solent. So it's all helpful to be clearer and more robust on those issues. And finally, there are catchment maps included in the new guidance, which is a step forward. Now, we are promised by Natural England that there will be an official nitrogen budget calculator released. And here is a sneak preview of it, which I was allowed for by Natural England. Um, they are still developing it. Um, it's had some issues and it's still going around Whitehall, I believe, to be for final checking. But it looks hopeful that it will be a useful tool for those people that need to assess the level of impact that their development will have in terms of nitrates and how much mitigation will be required. Um, finally, on, on the changed advice, I'll have a look at <coughs> some of the criticisms which the Developer Forum have previously raised against the last version and see to what extent they've been addressed in the new advice. First of all, the background nitrogen in potable water supplies, as we've seen, 
there is now some correction to that, although it's far smaller than the development industry was asking for. It's only two milligrams per litre, but it's better than nothing. The double counting because of internal population migration within the catchment area, there is reference to that and it, the guidance is helpful, but they fudged the issue really. And ultimately what they say is that we have to go to our local planning authorities and to negotiate with the planning authorities with evidence to um, justify how much um, migration from within the area we think our development will have. In terms of the robustness and the origin of nitrogen runoff figures for urban areas and for SANGs, it's still not clear enough and it could be made a lot clearer. There is still no account taken for proposed SUDs and filtration methods, which come as part of um, all large developments. Um, they have in many ways a, a good role in taking nitrogen out of um, the system for the impact, but a reducing impact, but they're still not taken into account in the official methodology. And there's no, uh, uh, sorry, there was previously no account taken of the pathways or the distance or the time taken from the site, the development site to the water body, and now that is taken into account to some extent at least. We are still stuck with the arbitrary 20% buffer, which you need to apply at the end of your nitrogen calculation, um, but the Natural England approach there is that this is a precautionary approach, which is imposed by the habitat regulations, so they deem that as, as um, being served by the 20% buffer at the end. One can argue, but ultimately, Okay, so I'll finish the um, presentation by thinking about the different options for mitigation and the solutions. <clears throat> it's important to say that there's no one fix for this issue. Every site is different, every development is different, there's different circumstances in play. It's a very complex um, scenario really, and, and each site and scenario has to find its own solution or set of solutions for this, which does make it more complex than other um, mitigation proposals such as the uh, the recreational disturbance um, on the Solent Coast, which is solved by simply imposing a, a financial contribution, which can be used to um, hire wardens on the beaches and um, advise dog walkers, for example. We're, we're not in that sort of territory, I'm afraid, in terms of solving this one. The first solution which was put forward by um, Kit Mulhouse when he was the housing minister was simply for permissions to be granted, but with a preoccupation Grampian condition to say that you could build your development, but you couldn't occupy it until you've achieved nitrogen neutrality. Um, whilst that looked like a, an attractive option at first, in reality, no um, developer of any size is going to be able to borrow money on the um, hope that you'll manage to resolve your nitrogen neutrality in the three years you've got before your permission expires. So it's a great degree of risk and uncertainty. It caused contractual headaches for landowners in terms of um, triggering option agreements, and it didn't solve um, the five-year housing land supply or housing delivery test arguments if, if homes were not being occupied. The key solution which um, most people have heard of and is the most if you like, common solution to this is to take agricultural land and to take it out of agriculture and to change it into a use which is more, which is less reliant rather on nitrogen inputs. So that could be woodland or it could be parks and open space, all of which rely on less nitrogen inputs than farming does. Um, it's a good solution for very large sites and greenfield sites which have plenty of land that they can bring to the table and offer as offsetting land for mitigation. It's a poor solution for smaller sites or for brownfield sites or urban sites generally, um, which are not generally likely to have any land that they can achieve this on. It's also important to think about the impact of this on local food production. Clearly, the more land we take out of agriculture, the more likely it is that there will be pressure on local food production and it'll ultimately reduce. And at the time when we are going to leave the European Union and thinking about um, sustainability in terms of food miles, is that something we really want to be encouraging? It's a difficult balance. One very positive step um, in the recent months has been that the um, Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust has stepped forward as a potential broker for securing agricultural land um, and taking it out of agriculture in order to mitigate the nitrates issue. The scheme operates um, like this, that the 
developers would pay a financial contribution to the trust through section 106 agreement the trust would collect those contributions from different sites pool them together buy agricultural land preferably lower grade agricultural land which is not going to have an impact on food production and they will turn it into woodland wildflowers wildflower meadows um, or wetlands um, and thereby increase biodiversity and potentially increase public access as well where that's appropriate so it's a win-win in terms of um, mitigating the problem and also increasing the amount of biodiversity and um, wildlife areas where people can enjoy the benefits of, of these um, the scheme has now been approved by natural england and the first site has been um, bought has been acquired on the isle of wight um, and that is in effect so if we look at the benefits and the questions for the wildlife trust scheme it is fantastic that this offers a financial contributions mechanism to solve the problem because that solves the issue for the small sites and for the brownfield sites that don't have agricultural land of their own that they can bring to the table but beyond that it provides a strategic approach because it avoids ad hoc bits of land being taken out of agriculture um, and it allows this to be done on a strategic level where the trust carefully monitor the types of agricultural land that are being taken out of agriculture and the benefit that they are being put to in terms of their ultimate end use clearly the trust can offer a high quality long-term management for, the, for that land for the public benefit in terms of wildlife and public access um, and it's easier for Natural England and for the LPA to enforce that the land change is in perpetuity because it's in the hands of a well-respected charity um, which are, are um, tasked for this purpose. Now there are some question marks over the scheme. Um, first of all there's the scale of operation. Um, the Wildlife Trust have been clear that the first land purchase allows about 1,075 kilograms of nitrates to be offset which is a good start but clearly that's not going to solve the problem of over 7,000 homes being caught up in the system, not being able to go forward. But what the trust are telling me is that they have got a pipeline now to um, secure further additional sites, and they are looking at a total amount of about 12,000 kilograms um, of nitrates offsetting target for the next few years. Now that's not insignificant, that will allow a fair few number of homes to be built, um, but clearly what the trust say is that they can't be the only solution, they are just part of a package of solutions. Um, so it, we shouldn't look to them to solve all of this problem by themselves. Another issue has been what the impact of all of this buying up of agricultural land will have on the, the agricultural land market. Um, it has had some impact. Um, anecdotally, prices have risen as um, landowners have cottoned on to the fact that they're farming land, whilst it may not never have any other development value, is now extremely valuable as offsetting land. Um, but the trust points out that the farms they're looking at are more likely to be those which are uneconomic. Um, generally, there has been a, a deflationary land market due to Brexit, um, and certainly that's been heightened now because of the COVID crisis. Um, and so any increases because of speculation might only be um, offsetting the, the previous um, decrease which there has been due to those more structural processes going on. Another issue is will local planning authorities accept mitigation um, that has um, whereby a site is in one local authority area and the mitigation land secured by the trust or, or anyone else is in another local authority area. Now clearly the important thing here is that the mitigation land needs to be in the same river catchment but that's clearly not how local authority boundaries are made up. Um, and I'm advised by the trust that they are working on this issue. They are actively negotiating with um, local planning authorities. And there are at least two local planning authorities which are now accepting um, this cross boundary mitigation approach, which is hopeful, even if not all of them are. Now on that slide, you'll see the email address to write to um, the Wildlife Trust. If you're interested in finding out more about their scheme, they're very keen for people to do so and to register an interest if you're a developer um, and I would encourage you to do so. So if we look finally at um, a, a few of the other types of mitigation, so not offsetting land, um, one of those is to apply water efficiency measures. There is a correlation between reduction in water usage and the need to 
increase the level of nitrogen that wastewater treatment works take out at source. Um, this is because of how nitrate permits are expressed in milligrams per litre. Therefore, the further water use is reduced, the more in terms of the actual nitrogen will have to be taken out of the, the overall quantity of water that's discharged. The important thing is here that most development now is built to 110 um, litres per person per day or lower um, if that can be achieved. But you actually get more bang for your buck if you can actually retrofit existing housing stock. Because we have to remember that the new homes coming on stream every year are only a tiny fraction of all of the homes in our region and it's really that retrofitting of existing stock which is going to make the biggest difference <clears throat> one local authority which has championed this approach is portsmouth city council they have a scheme now in place which is been approved by natural england and um, involves them retrofitting the water efficiency um, improvements in their own social housing stock which is considerable in Portsmouth, and they claim that the, this process will allow up to 500 homes to be built each year for the next 10 years in the city um, without additional impact on the Solent, which is the important thing. There is a charge for this, as you will see, to developers, um, and developers will clearly have to weigh up whether that's the best option in terms of mitigation for them, given that developments on um, Portsmouth are unlikely to have lots of excessive land that they can take out of um, agriculture to achieve mitigation in another way. So it's a very positive development, I believe. Another approach is to create strategic wetlands downstream of wastewater treatment works. Um, the important thing is here that the water, the discharge from wastewater treatment works is directed through the wetland areas Wetland ecosystems are effective in removing nitrogen from water, and then the water that is discharged from the wetland is cleaner in terms of nitrates than it was when it entered. So a, a good um, mechanism for nitrogen removal, albeit that these areas require quite expensive and ongoing maintenance and upkeep. So they are um, not something that you can sort of put in place and walk away from, and therefore you have to think about um, who has um, management responsibilities for this um, in perpetuity. It's a, an approach which is being used by some local authorities. The case study I would use here is, is New Forest District Council. Um, they are looking at this site for, amongst others, which is um, called Corks Farm. It's adjacent to Slow Hill Cops Wastewater Treatment Works. It is an emerging allocation in the new local plan that's about to be adopted for 150 dwellings. Uh, whilst it was requiring a 2.9 hectare SANG, the thinking is that at least some of this SANG area, in addition to land that Southern Water own adjacent to the site, could be used instead to create a wetland environment to capture the nitrogen from Slow Hill Cops wastewater treatment works. This would be a benefit to much wider area than just Corks Farm itself. It would allow further development in the waterside area of, of uh, um, new forest to be nitrogen neutral um, and you could even achieve public access and some of the sang type benefits if you put in place wooden walkways and decking to allow um, appropriate public access to these areas without damaging the ecosystems um, and um, getting your feet wet quite frankly okay so finally the last few options i would term after one of my favorite films the good the bad and the ugly um, and by that I mean the good catchment sensitive farming. Back to farming. Um, we talked before about changing habits in farming. Um, you need to effectively um, persuade and indeed bribe farmers to do this. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that um, as long as that will allow the development industry to demonstrate that they are achieving nitrogen and neutrality for their developments. Um, the problem is, is that how you monitor this to make sure that any changes in catchments, so um, the reduction in use of nitrate fertilizers by farming, is in perpetuity, and how you can actually um, demonstrate that to Natural England. It's not an easy task, and Natural England are somewhat pessimistic about this um, option at the moment. But um, in terms of actually solving the problem and actually reducing the level of nitrogen in the Solent, it's got to be one of the most positive 
schemes um, with, with greatest potential. That's the good. The bad, um, I would say land management sharp practice here really. When you undertake your nitrogen budget, you have to look at the type of farming that was in place before you change your land to development. Clearly, the more intensive the nitrogen inputs to that farming, the greater bang for your buck you're going to have in taking that land out of agriculture and making it development area. So there was some thinking that you would convert land into pig farming or poultry farming um, for a year or two before you applied for your planning permission for homes. And then you'd get a, a huge red, um, paper theoretical reduction in nitrogen. Clearly, that's not something that anyone would advocate because it, it's really just fraud um, and is not something which uh, is going to solve the problem for the solent. And finally, the ugly, um, if all else fails, you can install the technology on a development site which will physically remove the nitrogen from water as it leaves the site. Um, this is going to be costly, it's fairly ugly, it um, could be odorous as well, so is not something that um, is recommended as a first choice, but um, it is an option which remains there for those which have explored every other eventuality and um, cannot um, achieve nitrogen neutrality in any other way. Okay, well, I hope um, that you've um, furthered your understanding of the issue through that presentation. Um, thank you very much, and um, I will hand back to Laura, who I believe is going to collate some questions, if there are any. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. So, yeah, just want to say firstly, thanks for taking the time today to share your knowledge on nitrates. Um, very interesting. And we have received quite a few questions. Um, so, in terms of the partnership for South Hampshire, firstly, um, do you know if they are preparing a mitigation strategy? Yes, um, they are. They have a, um, a body which meets regularly with representatives from all local authorities on the partnership. They are certainly looking for a strategic um, mitigation option, but it's not in place yet. It, it will take a couple of years. Um, I think the problem is, is that because of the, um, the need for options to come forward as soon as possible, it's making individual local authorities have to do their own thing because they can't sit back and wait for um, the partnership to get its hands together, to get its act together rather. So um, unfortunate, but it will take time. Yeah. And um, in terms of the Isle of Wight scheme, which areas can be mitigated by this scheme? Um, I, I'm afraid I don't know which of the two local authorities which have agreed to accept that as mitigation, but clearly it, it is beyond just the Isle of Wight itself. Um, the answer to that could be found if you write to the, um, the trust because they are clearly the ones doing the negotiating but in theory um, it could be any of the, the authorities on the north coast of the Solent. Okay and in terms of um, local plan authorities how are they responding to mitigation land in a separate local authority boundary and is it creating legal issues or difficulties when it comes to signing the section 106? Yes, um, they're very um, reluctant to accept mitigation land in other local authority areas. I think to some degree this is a legal problem to do with the Section 106 agreement, although I can't believe that that isn't possible to overcome. I think probably more it's a political issue. It's members from that local authority just feeling uncertain about handing on their responsibility for the, uh, the mitigation land to another local authority um, when they want to keep it within their own areas. It's probably as simple as that. And staying on the theme of um, local authorities, is there a reason that some of the authorities in the Solent catchment area, such as East Hants, have so many less units held up by nitrates? It all comes down to their view of risk um, for judicial review. Clearly, Natural England's advice um, is important. It's a material consideration, an important one of that, but it is only advice. Um, the local planning authorities are the decision-making bodies and they must make their own mind up, weighing all of the risks and, and public benefits of the development um, into the equation. And all I think we're looking at is that some local authorities have taken a very different view of that balance um, and, and thus you come out with very different outcomes in terms of the application of the, uh, the advice. And yeah, someone's gone on to ask, um, 
if the requirements from the natural England um, methodology exceeds the requirements in local planning authorities, which requirements should be complied with? Well, you should be using the natural England advice and the methodology. And once the calculator is released, you should be using that calculator as well. And local authorities shouldn't, without very good reason, be um, de deferring from that. Um, however, as per the last question, if there is a point which is in argument, um, clearly the local planning authority is the decision making body and as long as they can justify it, you really need to go along with what they're saying. And just staying on the um, nitrates methodology, 100 litres per person per day is beyond the tighter building regulation target. Is the natural England advice sufficient evidence to include this in a local plan? This is the area where I think Natural England are in difficult ground. Um, they've they covered it in a confusing way in the, the guidance. What they're saying is that um, we should be seeking a stricter target of what they say is 100 litres per person per day. But because of slippage in how people actually don't apply that, then the benefit you can apply to your calculations is only 110 litres per person per day. Now, that's a confusing message, isn't it? Because therefore, you know, Developers see well, 110 seems to be what I have to put into my um, calculator. Therefore, why am I trying to target anything else? So I think naturally England need to do more work if they really feel that we should be going beyond the um, the building regulations and local plan requirements, which generally are based on 110 litres per person per day. Yeah, thank you. Um, if there is no permit at the treatment plant you're relying on, do you use a figure of 25 or 25 mg litres? Uh, it's 27 milligrams per litre. Okay. Is the um, previously, you were allowed to accept 90% of that, whereas now you're not. You have to apply the full um, 27. However, you are allowed to take off your two milligrams per litre for background water. So that does eventually get you to the figure of 25. Um, but you have to understand how you get from the 27 to the 25. And on wastewater treatments. Is it possible to place more responsibility on wastewater treatment undertakers to clean up their outfalls? Could Natural England and the Environment Agency work in a more joined up approach when regulating water companies? Yes. <laughs> well, we, my experience is that they've only really just started working properly together because of this crisis. So, so it's good that they are working together now. Um, the limits or the permits are set by the Environment Agency, not by Natural England, and that's an important distinction to understand. They do have a rolling programme of reviewing those permits, but that takes an awful long time. They're, they're saying sort of a you know, number of years that it could take. They have, they had, sorry, started to accelerate that programme to review the permits. This was both to review existing permits and also to apply permits to those wastewater treatment works that don't currently have them. But unfortunately, that work stopped as soon as the coronavirus crisis started because um, environment agency personnel were diverted onto other more pressing matters so hopefully it'll be picked up in the coming months again. Yeah and how do you see the local plan authorities discretion introduced in version four of their natural and guidance so for example internal population mitigation migration impact and on provision of affordable housing and care home developments and they've said it seems that the guidance update could allow such sites to be unlocked as the occupants will already be living in the caption. Correct, yes. Um, there is an acknowledgement that not all people watched by homes are coming from outside of the, the area, but it's for the developer to demonstrate to the local planning authority the degree to which they think this applies to their development. So, for example, 100% affordable homes um, could have a good case for saying that um, there will be no one coming from outside of the area um, and all people are living within the affected area, therefore there should be no mitigation um, required. Whether local authorities are accepting that case or not, I, I don't know. I haven't heard personally that they have been, but in theory it should um, apply. And for a um, much smaller scale, do you know if there are on any on-site mitigation options for single dwellings? A single dwelling? are very difficult. Um, if they are in a main sewer area um, and they require some level of, of um, mitigation because of the their impact, 
um, their only real option at the moment is to look to the um, Hampshire Island White Trust to try and secure through financial contribution, uh, which clearly for one dwelling, dwelling would be a modest contribution, um, so hopefully affordable. Other than that, if they are um, some distance from a public sewer, they can look at a package treatment plant, and if they get one that is sufficiently um, robust in removing nitrogen, that might be enough to solve their problems, but that could be quite costly, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, and volume house builders are often negotiating with landowners who own more land than the site with potential for housing. Are there opportunities to secure improved working practices on the other land through the purchase of the housing site? So, for example, contractually between the developer and the landowner? That would be fantastic if it could work like that. So that um, talks to my, you know, good um, uh, uh, conclusion at the end of, of changing um, agricultural practice. The problem I would repeat though is is how you demonstrate to Natural England or the Planning Authority that that agreement by the farmer to may use less fertilizer will go on in perpetuity without fail for 80 years because unless you can demonstrate that Natural England the local planning authority simply won't accept it. Now clearly if you took the land out of the farmer's ownership and gave it to someone else then then that might be the case but but that's not what is generally being considered it, it's a, it's looking for ways in which existing farmers can work their own land to better effect and can bank the reductions in nitrogen that they're actually achieving and, and who can benefit from them. We're not there yet, but I'm hopeful that, that that might be part of the mix that we ultimately get to if we can find a way of, of monitoring it and demonstrating in perpetuity. Yeah. And on to the last question. How is this issue being treated at planning appeals, particularly if you can secure Natural England support on your solution, but the relevant local plan authority rejects it? Um, it's an interesting um, case study really, because the, the appeals that have been seen by me so far, and there have been a few of them, have tested this idea of um, Grampian conditions um, and the planning inspector in each case has rejected the approach because of the lack of certainty were by which the um, nitrogen neutrality mitigation will come forward in the three year time limit. Generally, um, where Natural England are in favour um, of a development that definitely weighs for it but if the local planning authority um, is still resisting it it depends on the reason that they're resisting it if they're resisting it only because of nitrates um, I haven't seen a case like this but I believe the planning inspector would um, be likely to allow the appeal if there are other issues of course then then it has to be one of a number of issues that are put in the planning balance brilliant Okay, great. Well, as I said before, all of the questions um, we'll aim to hopefully answer within the next week or so. And looking forward, I just thought I would share the next um, webinar, which will be led by the RPPI South East, which will focus in on the LAPC route to chartership and takes place on the 3rd of June at 11am again. So I hope you all enjoy today's webinar and please do complete the feedback survey which should be emailed to you shortly after this webinar. And also please do feel free to contact myself, Peter or Susan, the Southeast coordinator, if you have any other questions. And once again, a huge thanks to Peter for giving up his time today and we hope you found it all very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much, bye-bye. Thank you, bye now.